The Vikings about to close out their preseason, so what is there that is left to determine? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so very much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day, each and every day. My hashtag every day is I appreciate you all so very much. We're almost through this preseason, almost on to the real thing. So thank you so much for rolling with me throughout all of it. If you are new here, hello and welcome. My name is Luke, and you can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Just search out Locked On Vikings on any podcast listening app, including the SiriusXM app. And if you just search out the Minnesota Vikings, you can also find uh, live broadcasts of any Vikings game, including this Saturday's game against the Eagles. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet five bucks and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Today on the show, we got to preview a preseason game. It's an in, a, kind of a weird moment where uh, very little of what happens in this game will have an outsized effect on the Minnesota Vikings season, but that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of really sort of last chance moments to watch for. So who is on their last grasp with the Vikings? Many people we will see for the last time in purple. I'm sure a lot of them are, you know, small time guys, undrafted rookies that you might not care too much about. But then there are other players that might be seeing their last moments in purple that you probably care a lot about. So we'll talk about kind of who needs to show out, who needs to have a big day and uh, generally what I'll be watching for in that preseason game. We'll also do an Everyman series entry as well, as well as an update on that series for this season. So moving onward, uh, the Vikings have a game against the Eagles and Jaron Hall will start it. We'll see no Nick Mullins. That implies that you're not really going to see a lot of the twos in general. And I think maybe the rule, the rule will be if you're on the twos and you have made the team, you will not play. And the Vikings have made a couple of little random transactions that will help them facilitate this. They signed Mo Ibrahim, Gophers legend. I'm sure, you know, Minnesota Gophers slash Minnesota Vikings fans will be very excited to, about that. If you're a huge Gophers fan, now you can get your Ibrahim jersey, your purple Ibrahim jersey, just like you dreamed about. Although I don't know if his stay here is going to be very long. Uh, you can also find Matt Sindrick, who is back. He was an undrafted rookie last, uh, th this, this draft, he got cut before camp. He's returned now as, uh, they, they put Jeremy Flax on IR. Um, speaking of IR, Najee Thompson, who was waived injured yesterday, he is now, or on, on Wednesday, um, on Thursday, he cleared waivers and is now on the Vikings injured reserve. The way that it works with those guys, by the way, um, and Jabril Cox actually just had this happen. So Jabril Cox had been waived injured. He reverted to IR. He cleared waivers. He is now healthy. So when you're on season-ending IR, but you are healthy, the union doesn't like that. NFLPA doesn't like that. So you will you, you essentially get released with an injury settlement. That injury settlement totals, um, and I believe counts against the cap uh, as like whatever game checks you would have gotten over the time that you uh, were out. So like for Jabril Cox, he gets paid for whatever preseason games, basically. Um, and then for the rest of the year, you're on your own. You're a free agent. Go get your money from another team. So for Najee Thompson, this could happen, right? Now he's got a knee injury and it actually it, uh, is possible that he gets knee surgery. So if he gets knee surgery and that like just fully ends his season, this won't come up. But if his knee injury is just like a minor sprain or something like that or something that will heal on its own and not take long or if there is a procedure, but it doesn't take long to heal and he would be ready. Let's say he would be ready by week six. Well, he's on season ending IR. Uh, so if he is ready by week six, he would basically get paid for those six weeks and then become a free agent and be you know, free to go get the other 11 weeks worth of game checks from whatever team will have him. 
So I wanted to like explain that in a lot of detail because I saw a lot of people responding to the waved injured news about Najee Thompson with like, oh no, you know, thank you so much for your service on the Vikings as though he will be gone forever. That's not necessarily the case. And if it is the case, we're not going to find out about that yet. We'll, we'll have to learn that news like for real later in the season. But Mo Ibrahim is here. That's interesting. And, and so I think what you're going to see is a lot of players who just have made the team won't play. I, maybe with the exception of rookies, like I could I mean, I could see them giving Dallas Turner reps just to give Dallas Turner some reps and help get it tread on his tires. But if if they're signing running backs like Ibrahim, I wonder if Kenny Wong will, will get any running reps or if it'll just be Miles Gaskin out the gate getting taken, taking handoffs from Jaron Hall. Will you see Tristan Jackson or Brandon Powell or Jalen Naylor play in this one? I kind of think no. And you're going to start out with Trent Sherfield, uh, who is, by the way, one of those players who I think needs to have a good game. I think Trent Sherfield still is, for me, on the bubble. I did a 53-man roster yesterday. Still, for me, on the bubble, special teams helps a lot. Uh, but he could like drop two really bad passes and play his way off the team. And he could also have a really good game and, 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 you know, solidify his spot and be the sixth wide receiver. I think your top five are very set and you need that sixth. Um, by the way, in injury news, Robert Tunyon, who is another player who I'm very curious to see if he plays or not, if he doesn't play, he's actually working back into practice. Uh, but if he doesn't play, it either means that he wasn't quite healthy enough to play. Kevin O'Connell said they were going to start working him back in. So either he just like didn't quite make it in time for the game or he made it. And, you know, we're not we're not uh, going to risk him re-aggravating his injury in that Eagles game. But we'll see who actually does play at tight end. They might need somebody like Nick Muse to play at tight end, even though I think Nick Muse has very much made the team. Or do they just roll out right away with... Uh, you know, Nikhil Harry and Samus Reyes basically playing the entire game because Trey Knox has been uh, waived injured. They also have Neil Johnson, this waiver guy that they got on Wednesday off of the off of the the, the Jets. Um, but yeah, Trey Knox also waived injured off the team. Was not going to make it. Had a pretty rough preseason, uh, in my opinion. So that's uh, sort of a moot point. And then what happens on that interior line? If like is Dan Feeney going to play or are they bringing in more more bodies because Reisner is not going to be ready to play uh, still nowhere to be found on practice unsure of what's going to happen with him. You might have another waved injured situation uh, or maybe even like a pup situation or something like that if they do even keep him or maybe they just let him go uh, or what's going to happen with Michael Jurgens with like I said Feeney um, or do you just kind of start out with that third group of like Henry Bird and Tyreek Stevenson and um, Michael Jurgens just, you know, playing a whole bunch of center just to get tread on his tires. But is he going to make it? I think Michael Jurgens is another player who can have a good game. And because he's a draft pick, you're a little bit more nervous about exposing him to waivers. Uh, it, here's the thing, though, about exposing a guy to waivers. And we'll, we'll have this. I'll probably get this question a bunch after cut down day. But typically guys getting claimed off of waivers is rarer than you think. It doesn't never happen. It does happen sometimes, but it's rarer than you think because of like, think about it logically, right? You've got a seventh round pick. He doesn't make the team. You cut him for another team to poach him. They have to put that seventh round pick on their 53 man roster. Their own seventh round pick might not have made their 53 man roster because of roster pressure, Right. And you just made decisions to keep guys on the roster because they were in camp with you all summer long and they earned it. And then you got to cut one of those guys to bring in this dude. You like kind of had a dry high draft grade on, but not a high enough draft grade to draft him before the, the top, you know, 200 picks. So when it comes to guys like Jurgens, I, I feel a little safer exposing them to waivers than I think a lot of people do. That's not to say it never happens, right? This is how the Vikings got Theo Jackson. It's how Marcus Epps became an Eagle, and now he's a Raider, and he's actually a starting caliber player for them. Um, so it does happen, but it's less than you think. But I think maybe the, the biggest intrigue of the entire game is going to fall on Jaron Hall. What do we see from him 
Does he prove that he belongs on the true roster as the QB three versus generic, you know, waiver claim quarterback number one, right? Speaking of claiming guys off of waivers, that might be a place the Vikings are interested in looking. Uh, and also Matt Corral will play. So I guess there's that. And he I guess he has every opportunity to kind of prove that he earns that job. But obviously, that's a pretty tall order. Um, we'll talk about the kind of same ideas on the defense and just generally like what we're looking for. But these kind of last chance players, then, of course, an entry into the Everyman series. That'll all come up on Lockdown Vikings. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you are thinking about getting into therapy, but one of the biggest barriers for people getting into therapy, especially men getting into therapy, is this idea that like therapy isn't for them. And that might stem if you had an experience with a therapist that you didn't like and you assumed all therapists are like that. But I'm here to tell you that it's not that way. And trying out a few therapists on for size and seeing who really jives with you and who who you could see yourself having that sort of important relationship with is an important part of the process of getting into therapy. And with BetterHelp, you can switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. They'll set you up with someone they think is right for you. And if that doesn't work out, you can switch to someone else. No biggie. Give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash locked on. That's betterhelp.com slash locked on to get 10% off of your first month. Once again, that is betterhelp.com slash locked on. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. When you're done here, go check out Locked On Fantasy Football. Get that edge that you need with Vinny Iyer, and you can dominate your coworkers or family members or whoever you are in a league with and merci- mercilessly put their faces in the dirt like they so deserved your loved ones that have not been good enough to you. Um, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> that got away from me. Moving on. Let's talk a little bit about the defense here and what to expect from the Eagles game. That if Jaron Hall isn't the most intriguing thing on the Vikings roster, the defensive line is. There are so many young guys vying for a roster spot, but unfortunately, um, maybe the guy we were all the most interested in in Gabe Murphy hasn't been out there injured, unclear where the, what the deal is with that. So that's another situation you might see a waved injured thing go down. You might see him, um, you know, start on pop or something like that. But it it's also just really hard to justify carving out one 53 man roster spot for him, no matter what your expectations were at the outset, when you have guys like Bo Richter and Jalen Redmond and, um, you know, Owen Porter and like these, these young guys that are really showing out, not to mention veterans that you could already have kind of penciled into that job status quo style, like Jihad Ward and Jonah Williams. Um, it's really difficult. When I did the 53 man roster yesterday, I ended up keeping 10 defensive linemen. That is an obscene amount of defensive linemen, but there were just, it was just too hard to cut all those names. Like I would have had to cut somebody like Levi Drake Rodriguez. And I felt like he had earned that. I do think Levi Drake will play, uh, just by virtue of being a rookie and it gives him another chance. And therefore it exposes him to the idea of having an awful game and maybe playing his way off of the roster. But I think that, that from what we've seen his play is, or from what I've seen, I think his play is sustainable enough. Like not only was it good, but it's good in a very permanent repeatable way where I'm like not worried about that. But I don't know if you see a lot of Jonah Williams Here's an interesting one. I don't know if you see Jaquel and Roy. I didn't have him in my 53-man roster projection, and I could very well be wrong about that. He is one of these players that he's probably played about as much as Jalen Naylor, and in the same drives, you know, first, second drive, and that's kind of it. So, like, do I cut that guy? Kind of feels like they're, they're higher on that guy than I am, even though he's had a quiet preseason while he's barely been in it. So, you know, it's like having like a Brandon Powell type of preseason where it's like, well, it's clear that they like you and that they're probably going to keep you. And you probably didn't need the preseason because of that. So a quiet preseason, like maybe I'm overreacting to it. I don't feel good about that decision, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I could definitely be proven wrong there, which is fine. But will he play? And 
Will he outplay somebody like Levi Drake Rodriguez, somebody like Jalen Redmond, who I think has had a pretty good preseason uh, on the Minnesota football party, which, by the way, you can catch me on Tuesday or uh, Mondays and Thursdays on Locked on Minnesota Sports. They they even posited a possible cut for Jerry Tillery without playing in the preseason at all, which I think is um, or well, he played like one, the one drive the starters played uh, in, uh, in the Raiders game, which I think was a bridge too far for them, but, uh, an idea to keep in mind and it doesn't get any easier at edge. You've got Patrick Jones, Jihad Ward. Maybe this is the last grasp for Andre Carter. You want to talk about last chance players. I would put Andre Carter in that bucket, uh, where even though he has improved, he, he looks like an NFL player now, but just maybe not one that makes a 53. But before it looked like I was like, why are you on this field? Uh, now you can see why he's on the field in the third quarter of our preseason game. But both for the better and the worse of that, like we forget if you're on the on an NFL field for the third quarter of a preseason game, you did pretty well uh, in, in your career, which, you know, hey, going over the Everman series like so many people don't make it right. Um, but. I also kind of see why you're on the field in the third and fourth quarter in a preseason game. Uh, so it, there's a last chance there. And then just like so many of these undrafted guys and Bo Richter will be the, the, the real interesting one to watch. I think Bo Richter has laid the groundwork for a case for the 53 man roster. I didn't put him in mine just to kind of play it safe in default. And because after I was just coming off of the Browns tape where I had seen him make as many errors as good plays. And when you're an undrafted free agent up and down, doesn't instill a lot of trust in coaches. It's like, can I trust you to, you know, play and be in the game? Um, so he's going to be one that I'm watching really closely. What can he do in that Eagles game? If he can pop, really pop off, that will change the vibe a lot. If he can pop off and he can play consistently and really go nuts, you go, man, this dude had a great preseason. I don't think you can justify cutting him. Just as like a merit decision, forgetting about what about exposing him to waivers and all that stuff. He's an Air Force edge. I don't know how many people had like super high draft grades on him. That'll be like lurking around waiting to poach him. Um, it's a matter of merit. It's a matter of did you earn this? Do you deserve this? And right now, I can see a case for it, but I probably wouldn't do it. Give me one more really good game, and I can absolutely see it. I get a, like I warm up to that quite a bit. And beyond that, this might be the last chance for Brian Ozemois. Uh, if we want to go off the defensive line here, uh, Ozemois has has I like I thought he was great last year in camp. I guess I was just wrong about that because <laughs> it was just like didn't do well, right? Uh, I thought he played really really well, but oh my god, Ivan Pace is better. That was my deal. Uh, and Ivan Pace obviously took all the reps from him as the small linebacker, but this year some some struggles in coverage, some some kind of brain fart moments, it makes it seem a little bit like uh, his his time here might be drawing to a close, and that would mean that somebody like Dallas Gant makes it over him. So with Azimwa, assuming he plays, if he doesn't play, I would say okay, his roster odds are looking pretty good. But there might be a world where he sits out the preseason game. Dallas Gant has the game of his life and takes the job. And there's a world where Asamoah plays against the Eagles, struggles, and then Dallas Gant has the game of his life, takes the job. I think that's a, a, a position battle that could turn absolutely over the course of this one game. I think it's close enough. Status quo, I think Asamoah still has the job, but it's close enough where one game could turn it. And then the defensive backs. I think Lewis seen as like a last chance guy is a pretty easy call. Even if you disagree with me about his game against Cleveland and you think it really was this meaningful improvement, I do not. Uh, if you're mad at me about that, I've got an article you can read. I've got a Patreon video you can watch and I've got a podcast you can listen to. So whatever medium you prefer, I've explained myself. Uh, you can find that those at wide left and patreon.com slash Luke Brown NFL respectively. And then lo locked on Vikings episode from earlier in the week. Um, but even if you think that was like a really good game, you got to prove it wasn't a one-off, right? That's, that's the other kind of caveat here is even if you believe in that game as a genuinely good one, you got to show up against the Eagles and do it again. So show me a really good game, right? And in, in a similar vein as Levi Drake Rodriguez, 
the problems that I had with Lewis scene are very repeatable and very sustained problems. They're things like, you know, issues with just the, the, the kind of slender frame that he has causing him to sort of bounce off of what would be easier tackles or get kind of bowled over like the Zach Charbonnet play from last year and a couple of them where he got bowled over it, but at least he held on to the guy this time, but they still are falling forward, you know, coverage errors, stuff like that. Uh, and fundamental coverage errors, you know, not parking yourself on the right landmark, that kind of stuff that's pretty unacceptable and makes it really impossible to put you on the field um, in, a, in a meaningful game. That stuff isn't a one-off problem. That's That stuff is... Th those problems will repeat themselves the longer he's on the field. So you got to go through the Eagles game and not have that stuff so that you can prove, hey... I know there were these things that, that we talked about in the Cleveland game. They're all mistakes that I'm over that I learned from and that I'm done with. You got to be able to prove that. And the corner room is going to be fascinating to me. We'll see how much Fabian Moreau plays. Uh, maybe the, the, we, so we did like a roster bubble thing on the Minnesota football party and they all called him a, a, a roster bubble player, I guess. But I've sort of seen him as like the fourth guy on the, on the, like competing with the Caleb Evans for the fourth guy on the roster. Now that Stefan Gilmore's in the building. Uh, and Dwight McLaughlin is somebody that I think just needs to put the exclamation point on his preseason. I think if I had to, if I did a 53 man roster now, which I did yesterday, I put him on it. I want to see the exclamation point, right? You can't get scorched now. Uh, it's like, just, just stick the landing kid and you're on. But there are so many other players that we're seeing potential last chance stuff with, uh, such as Jay Ward at whether you call him a corner or a safety right now, he's playing a little of both, uh, whether it's Duke Shelley who has not really had anything to write home about in the preseason, totally buried on the threes. I think it's really hard to find a place for him on the roster as exciting as, as everybody was so happy when he got the, when he got signed same day, Christian Darasaw got his big extension. The vibes were through the roof, but it, it, he has now gone a while without making the initial team he spent camp with. And that's, I guess just the stage of, the, of career that he is in. So some tough stuff to work through here on defense. Uh, and, one of the guys helping them work through all this and adding to that roster pressure is Stefan Gilmore, who has become one of the most respected defensive names in all of the NFL. And that ain't no accident. Every man series coming up next. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. It helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else. Over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're missing out on a huge pool of possible candidates. 86% of small businesses on LinkedIn get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. And 2.5 million small businesses are using LinkedIn for hiring. So this is, of course, a very huge thing. It's LinkedIn. It may as well be social media, but for career-focused people that might not even be looking for a job. But that doesn't mean they may not consider your job opening if it's right for them and if they're right for you. We understand that your, your small business is a unique snowflake with unique needs, and LinkedIn understands that you need to have a unique hiring process that fulfills those needs. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. The Everyman series is a series that we have been doing and are almost finished with on the Locked On Vikings podcast. We have been doing the Everyman series all summer long, detailing and telling the stories of everybody's journey to the NFL. Every new Viking from the undrafted rookies to the prize free agents, we've told their stories and how they got here and the kinds of people that they are, trying to get to know them on a human level best we can from a distance. There are only a few players left that I have not done, and a lot of them have joined in the middle of camp. Uh, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to do Stefan Gilmore today, and we're going to do Jonathan Grenard next week. We still haven't done Jonathan Grenard, and that's going to be it. Anybody else, if they make the team, and I haven't done them yet, I'll probably try to find a way to do them. 
But otherwise, there are a lot of guys that have joined in the middle of camp that I just haven't had time to get around to that are going to be like Mo Ibrahim. He's going to be here for three days and get cut. I'm not going to try to cram it in just for the sake of being a completionist. So um, it's it, it's supposed to be every man on the 90, but it's more about like every man on the 115 with all of this roster turmoil that's happened in this last uh, in, in this last month. So I'm not going to stress too much about it, but we'll get through the major stories. And today we're going to tell the major story of a starting cornerback now for the Minnesota Vikings in Stefan Gilmore. He grew up in Rock Hill, South Carolina, which is a fairly small town. An eight-year-old boy, a diehard Cowboys fan growing up, and the oldest of six. Both parents worked to support all those kids, so he kind of became a de facto third parent. I think a lot of you oldest siblings, especially if you were all latchkey kids, can kind of relate uh, that, you know, you kind of have to raise the kids a little bit <laughs> while mom and dad are off providing for the family. Uh, and he's frustrated because babysitting is not what he wants to be doing. This eight-year-old boy wants to play in the NFL. And when he gets older, he wants to go to the gym, right? He wants to go to the high school football field and stuff. But even at eight years old, he's motivated. He's with his dad doing cone drills in the backyard. And he's telling his dad, like, Dad, I, I'm tired. I don't want to keep going. And dad says, look, you, you, pay, you, you work hard now. It'll pay off later. You work hard now. It'll pay off later. And he takes that to heart. I think that adage becomes, like, core to who he is. The, the phrase self-discipline comes up a lot in anybody that tries to write about Stefan Gilmore's personality. Um, that self-discipline is what it takes for when you have family responsibilities and taking care of all your siblings, but you also have this dream of the NFL and you got to get that work in too. And to be, to get all that stuff in, in a day, you have to be self-disciplined and nobody's going to do it for you. Coach will do it for you when you're at practice, but this goes beyond practice. This is Stefan Gilmore's lifestyle. He's unbelievably serious about it, and he plays at an incredibly prestigious high school uh, that is fledgling when he is there. It's prestigious now because he came out of there, as well as Jadeveon Clowney, who he played with, at uh, South Point High School in Rock Hill. At the time, though, it was a fairly new program. He had to play quarterback. He was a really good athlete, best athlete on the team, so they put him at option QB. And he scrambled around. He did all kinds of cool stuff, enough to get the attention of SEC schools. He was that dynamic of an athlete, this very exciting, you know, very highly touted prospect. But you got to remember that there is a vision here. Stefan Gilmore has a plan. Um, and that's the other thing that comes up in all of the articles that like interviewed a coach or talked to somebody that knows him is like, oh yeah, Stefan Gilmore has a plan for that. So his plan for the NFL avoids quarterback like the plague. And I think that's pretty smart because being a college quarterback and getting to the NFL, I mean, what, like five or six of them get to the NFL, but with the kind of athlete that he was, he could play DB. And so he told colleges, I'm a play cornerback. Um, that didn't dissuade colleges. They, you know, the, the colleges that were willing to deal with that and say, okay, you know, you're probably going to be newish at the position and this is uh, going to be different. He narrows it down to Alabama and nearby hometown, South Carolina. The... So his dad wants him to pick South Carolina. Of course he does, right? Please stay close to home. Uh, he wasn't like a South Carolina fan by any stretch of the imagination. He was. He wasn't. He didn't really have like a, a home college team. But his dad is like totally wants that. But understands. I got to talk you out of Nick Saban. Like that's kind of hard. But he does end up going to South Carolina, and there are a couple of reasons for that that I think are really instructive on, on the, the mindset that we have. Remember, the goal is the NFL. Alabama has a lot of really good corners on it. And going to become a starter at Alabama is going to be a lot harder. When he goes to South Carolina, he starts as a true freshman. That's newish to the position, by the way. That doesn't have as much experience, but he starts. So part of it was that, just better opportunity. I can put more tape out there. I can grow better. I can get more reps. That's going to help my NFL prospects. But also, 
he relishes the challenge when he gets to South Carolina of turning around an ailing program. The Gamecocks were in a bad way. And when he was there, they experienced some moments that I'm sure Gamecocks fans are still fond of to this day. An SEC East championship, a very improbable upset over Alabama over the time he's there. And just by virtue of Stefan Gilmore choosing South Carolina over Alabama, this is how hyped of a kid he was. Other people start showing up. Alshon Jeffrey goes to South Carolina, a couple other people that were like high recruits at the time. So the program starts to build through that. And that vibe, that personality of self-disciplined, of self-discipline permeates through the South Carolina program. And I think might still be there. It does turn around while he is there. It's something that he sets out to do when he's there. But remember, the goal is the NFL. And by the time he's done at South Carolina, there had to have come a day, a moment where he where he understood. Maybe it was when he met with a committee that do, that like assesses you. But he's going to get drafted. There's not like drama on draft night about like he's drafted in the first round. And it's just a matter of where he's going to go. But on April 26th, 2012, same day that the Vikings picked Harrison Smith. The Buffalo Bills select Stephon Gilmore 10th overall. And he'll go to Buffalo, another place that needed a turnaround at the time. And Stephon Gilmore won't really be there to see the Bills turn around. They go through all kinds of turmoil. They've got their like Ryan Fitzpatrick chapter. They go through a weird fling with Rex Ryan, all kinds of weird stuff going on in Buffalo those years. Uh, But when he his rookie contract is up. They're going they go through a bunch of coaching changes as well. Uh, not just the Rex Ryan thing, but Sean McDermott comes in and elects not to franchise tag him, not to extend him, say, we're going to let you walk. You can go to free agency. Um, and Brandon Bean too. And where does he end up? Actually he flirts with the bears a little bit, but new England and what a Patriot he is, right? Mr. Self-discipline and hard work and culture guy. What a Patriot, right? Brian Flores falls in love with him. That's why we're, he's coming back here. Um, And that's where he's going to have his biggest moments in the NFL. He has this really key interception in the Super Bowl in 2018 against Jared Goff. He has Defensive Player of the Year in 2019. That's his peak. After New England is done with him, he plays out that contract in New England. And after that, we get journeyman mode. But, But this is already deep, deep, deep into his career. So we're very much in the veteran journeyman phase of the career, the twilight years. This might even be his last year. Very well could be. But you get a year in Carolina. You get a year in Dallas, which he grew up, you know, you know, his hometown team. And then the team he grew up loving as a kid. You got to remember that he was born before the Panthers. So, uh, you know, makes sense that he didn't grow up a Panthers fan because he probably picked maybe as a toddler, but that'll happen. Happened to me. Uh, that. So he gets to play for those teams and stuff, and 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 now here he is in Minnesota. Of course, the year with the Colts, you remember his uh, little uh, back and forth with Justin Jefferson in that Colts game a couple years ago. But now here he is in Minnesota, going opposite Justin Jefferson in practice all the time. And we'll see what the guy still has in the tank. But maybe the best reason not to, to bet against him is that ingrained personality trait, not a habit of self-discipline, but a personality trait of self-discipline. Talk to you on the other side of the Eagles game. And as always, Skull.